Welcome friends and comrades to another event hosted by the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. This time in conjunction with our friends from the Critical Theory Workshop and Monthly Review. We are here today to discuss the myth of the 68 thinkers, the topic of Gabriel Rockhill's recent article for the June issue of Monthly Review. Joining us is Gabriel himself and Imeric Monville. The event will commence with a 10 minute presentation from Imeric followed by a 20 minute presentation from Gabriel and we'll conclude with a discussion section wherein the audience will be capable of asking the speakers questions. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Gabriel and Americ, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us on. Okay, um, um, so thank you for your invitation. Of course. Um, so our, our first speaker is Americ uh, Monville, born in 1977. Americ Monville is the author of several philosophical essays. Uh, for many years, he has worked in publishing for the theoretical journal La Pensée. Uh, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Uh, and for various other publishing houses. Uh, his education... Uh, includes being an alumni of Sciences Po Paris, uh, studies in Latin, Greek, Old French, which he teaches, as well as philosophy. So thanks again for being here, comrade. You may commence your uh, presentation. Is mine. Um. Okay. Okay. I I I start my my presentation. You. I'm sorry. I have just to. to check. I will be ready in two seconds. Okay. I uh, I would like to thank you very warmly, and uh, Gabriel uh, in particular, and you all comrades for your invitation which is a great uh, honor to me. Um, 1968 was a year of revolt in uh, uh, many parts of the world, uh, both in the West and on the other side of the Iron Curtain. What they had in common was the uh, demographic, uh, numerical explosion of uh, young people, the generation born during and after the war. And what's more, young people who were increasingly educated as a result of social progress and the absence of global conflict, unlike the two previous generations. Um, there is this common group ground at the global level uh, in the West and in the East, but I think it's an illusion to compare six, uh, 68 in the West with 68 in the East. What was known in the West as the Prague Spring was very similar to 1966 in Budapest and to 1953 in East Germany, uh, 56 in Budapest. And it will also be the same in Poland in the early 80s. It revealed the weakness in the socialist countries where socialism had been imposed from outside thanks to military defeat with insufficient national consensus. The situation of objective weakness that the Western secret services had also been able to exploit. And in China, the Cultural Revolution began two years earlier and lasted another eight years. It was certainly going to have a major influence on our 68 years in the West, but it was part of a context that was very specific to China, I mean. There's one thing in common in the West, in May uh, 68, uh, or what 
has been called the Italian Creeping May, which in fact lasted throughout the 70s, but also in the US. It was a very anti-capitalistic uh, context, but uh, one which claimed to criticize the, the traditional workers' movements from the left, in France, the Union CGT, and in and the French Communist Party mostly. Of course, these organizations played a prominent role in the, in the events, uh, prominent parts, but the most obvious targets of this self-proclaimed avant-garde of the time were the Gaullists and the Communists. I mean, the two forces of armored resistance to Nazis who had occupied our country for four long years. These two glorious forces in 1945 declined sharply after 1968. And personally, I've always found it worrying that the fighters against fascism were the losers in this affair. Strange for a revolution. As for Gaullism, I imagine you can, you're going to tell me, maybe, that it was simply the powers that be, the conservatives, bourgeois, and therefore anything we could do against them was a good thing. That's not an entirely true. I don't know if uh, anyone in the US knows this, but the general de Gaulle's policies, especially at the time, were very much opposed to American imperialism. De Gaulle took France out of NATO's integrated command. He gave the Phnom Penh speech in Cambodia against the war in Vietnam. He teased uh, the United States in Quebec, where he said long live uh, free Quebec, Quebec, and in Mexico too. In any case, de Gaulle had become a target of the US. He had always had to fight during the war to ensure that France would be the victor of the war and not to be subjected to the plan prepared for France by the Americans, which was identical to the one made for Sicily, for instance, uh, for our enemy and a defeated country. And let's not forget that the American government had for a long time put its faith on the Pétainiste Admiral Darlan. Uh, which was a Nazi co collaborator, uh, and only at the very end decided to support the goal. As for the Communist Party is concerned, the objection that to what I'm saying, uh, I was saying it that in '68 it had become obsolete, too soft, and the fact is that today it's no, it's true that today is no longer a Leninist party, but a Social Democratic Party, but that wasn't the case in the in '68, and it was also a mass. And class party uh, with, with, with a strong legitimacy. So arriving with more demanding slogans, but representing no, no one like uh, all the leftists at this moment was obviously playing into the hands of division. An uh, objective criterion for judging the practical effectiveness of the Communist Party is its uh, ability to organize strikes. The fact is that there ha have never been as many strikes in France as there were in '67. It's I think there was a downturn after 68 too. Despite it's through the magnificent social advances following the blockade by 10 million strikers and the Grenelle agreements, Grenelle agreements, it means them, that it was not signed by the units, but implemented all the same by the government and employers in the face of pressure that tried to five a 35% increase in the minimum wage and a 10% increase in other wages with the creation of company trade union sections in the in the factories. It is true that uh, uh, after inflation, the crisis is making itself fat and will soon wipe out these gains. The key word for understanding all these paradoxes, which were the paradoxes of the 50s and 60s that followed, was uh, Michel Foucault, a Marxist thinker close to the French Communist Party at the, at the time, who in 1971 coined the, the concept of libertarian liberalism um, because then uh, appeared a phase of compromise with the neo-capitalism introduced by the Marshall Plans uh, some years uh, before with a new model as usual repressive towards the producers but now permissive toward the, towards the consumer. After the war, fortunately, the fall of the US, uh, its territory were, was unscathed but uh, Europe was in ruins. These were surpluses to be disposed of so that there were there would be no crisis of outlets. People have to be made to consume, even if the development of capitalism has uh, uh, given rise to the new middle classes, which are no longer characterized by owning small means of productions, but being uh, uh, managers. They, they will no longer be characterized by what they have, but what by what they uh, consume. They will therefore be able to develop more conspicuous um, uh, conception. But it takes people to produce what others 
uh, consume. So on the contrary, Kruska, Michel Kruska, clearly shows that the working class, contrary to what people like Mark Marcus, Marcus, Albert Marcus said, had not sold out uh, itself for a plate of lentils in the sense that it did not have, have access to the libidinal, playful and marginal conceptions of these new middle classes, but only had access to capital goods necessary in any case to increase production. A car, for instance, to get, get to work, a washing machine so that the wife can go to to work too as well a fridge so that the children don't start while the husband and the wife are out working so the, the, during these years the middle classes were indeed integrated not not the, the working class but the middle classes were in, integrated into the dominant power as had happened with fascism except that with fascism we were in a, an economy of scarcity so the values were traditionalist and puritanical. In a society of pure industrial development like the post-war period, power was going to be given to those who could consume to the detriment of those who could produce. In a sense, there was a workers' May 68, which led to immense working class achievements and a Bastille day for the new middle classes. Uh, that was another part, to impose a new way of life, but not for everyone, just for those who could afford it, and one that corresponds perfectly to the new imperatives of production. The result was a libertarian, liberal, social democracy, with the arrival in power of François Mitterrand, who, who was the so-called socialist president, but who, two years after coming to power, led France into the new liberalism of Thatcher and Reagan. From then on, on the 80s onwards, being left-wing no longer meant fighting for the rights of all, but simply asserting, for instance, that you were not racist, creating anti-racist associations and so on. Of course, racism is an important issue, it's an important fight, but it should be the basis, something that goes without saying, and that is part of a broad common cause of respect and dignity, including economic dignity for everyone. Historically, emancipation movements have often been linked to the workers' movements. On the contrary, with uh, this new form of neoliberalism, from now on, with this liber libertarian liberal social democracy, we will see the use of new struggles to replace the old one, the, I mean the class struggle, with the risk of identities splintering into communities instead of uni uniting the forces of the working people. In a sense, Emmanuel Macron um, actual uh, present president of France, who comes from this false socialism, is still following this line. The 68ers are still in power. For example, the government is now promoting a number of cosmetic reforms in the language of uh, women's rights, but at the same time, it's promise, promising to reform pensions, where, as we know, it is women, women who have uh, had to stop working because of pregnancy, who are uh, the first victims of these uh, reforms. We, th we think of women's rights, the, 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 the bourgeois woman, the woman who competes with men in politics, but we never, well, they never, the government never think of working women who are the vast majority in our countries. So in short, we are still in what uh, Kruska characterized, all is permitted for those who can afford it, but nothing is uh, possible. So um, there's, a, and there's an intellectual current that accompanies all these liberta liberal libertarian aspects of May 68, which doesn't totally explain it, but which are put for forward and above all with the, will be put forward later. Gabriel Rocchio has clearly shown how they were deliberately brought to the fore in the uh, 70s, encouraged by the American authorities to become French theory, which was a usurpation because French, th uh, French theory is obviously not limited to these thinkers, however gifted they may have been. Not all thinkers have thought uh, of it that way, but uh, what they have in common is a way of often, often uh, taking Marxism to the, in the opposite direction. Marxism is, in, is then caught between a structure without subject and subject without structure. In other words, in the face of the structure that is the state, the only opposition left is individual subjectivity, identity, with uh, the avowed and or unavowed, conscious or unconscious objective of not creating a revolutionary party, which would allow the alliance of revolution.
revolutionary subjectivities towards a real change of structure. From this point of view, French theory has one absolutely common point, uh, often little formulated as such, but present everywhere. I mean, anti-Leninism. Uh, and they are anti the construction of a mass and class party for, for the transition to the socialist mode of production. Uh, uh, against a party to defend itself, with democratic centralism, proletarian internationalism, the di dictatorship of proletariat, materialist dialectical philo philosophy, class struggle, and so on. Structuralism was the major current of thought in the uh, 60s in France, and one that fitted in well with a high technocratic society. Uh, there have been undeniable, deniable achievements since Ferdinand Saussure, a Swiss uh, linguist at the turn of the century. Uh, Saussure thought uh, of, of language as a structure, but with his distinction between diachrony and synchrony, he was able to show how we move from one structure to another, how, how things uh, involve. With uh, Lévi-Strauss, called Lévi-Strauss, we are already taking into account the major achievements of this structural approach when analyzing myths in anthropology, uh, for instance, but when uh, Lévi-Strauss speaks of his preference for peoples without history and of his system as a Kantianism without a transcendental subject, it is already clear how we can drift towards a form of elitism, the consequence of which, in political terms, is a profound conservatism. The same applies to, for, to the stylistic analysis, uh, analysis of Bart and later Jeannette. This is a magnificent attempt to make text, literal text, literature text speak for themselves independently of context. But we can, can see uh, the ravages of this in teaching today. In the form of a vulgate, it leads to a completely uh, an historical way of looking at texts, so veritable uh, to a true formalism. It's the same thing with Lacan's Lacan's unconscious structured as a language, which is an important discovery that will leave room above all for the period, but it will leave room above all for the period of signifiers, which with, a, with content for the reference. Foucault, Foucault adored structures so much that he decreed a man's death. Finally, the use of structuralism was even more controversial in the field of Marxism itself, since the trial without subject, due to Althusser, would lead to the abandonment of the dialectics of nature, uh, the abandonment of humanism, and then the dialectics to court, uh, all in the name of uh, structuralism. And this iliatism will uh, give way to its mirror counterpart, uh, uh, um, deshelved subjectivist, supposedly freed from structure, a la Sartre, and his critique, of uh, the dialectical reason. Social democratization on the one hand and desperate initiative on the other. Desiring machines a la Deleuze and Guattari, philosophy as the arbitrary productions of concepts a la Deleuze, the return of Nietzsche, left wing Nietzscheanism. Derrida launched uh, deconstruction and said deconstruction, it's America. Deleuze, for example, is a great exegete of Kant and Spinoza, and the author of one of the best books on Proust. But uh, finally, Marxism wanted to be the heir of modern rationalism, which thought with Spinoza that freedom was uh, the intellection of necessity. In other words, uh, I am free insofar I understand the constraints, particularly social constraints, they wait on me and, can then, uh, and, and then I can try through political action to free myself from them. It's easy to see that with this binary split between structuralism on the one hand and existentialism on the other, we can no longer describe social processes. So I think that if these thinkers, sometimes profound, sometimes not, sometimes in good faith, sometimes not, uh, if they work so well, it's because they correspond to a zeitgeist too. too. Uh, so either conservatism or subjectivist agitation re revolt rather than revolution. Um, Kuska, on the other hand, placed himself on the side of the workers' movement of its mass party and tried to defend the Leninism that would also explore the question of the development, uh, development of subjectivity. But that's another story. Thank you. Thank you so very much, comrade. That was excellent. Um, so, uh, 
Okay, now for our, our keynote speech from Comrade uh, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel Rocco is a Franco-American philosopher, cultural critic, and activist. He is the founding director of the Critical Theory Workshop, which uh, co-hosted is co-hosting this event, and a professor of philosophy at Villanova University. His books include Counter History of the Present, Untimely Interrogations into Globalization, Technology, and Democracy from 2017, Interventions in Contemporary Thought, History, Politics, and Aesthetics from 2016, Radical History and the Politics of Art from 2014, and Logic of History from 2010. In addition to his scholarly work, he has been actively engaged in extra academic activities in the art and activist worlds, as well as a regular contributor to public intellectual debate. Thank you so much for being here, Gabriel. Well, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to uh, do another event with Midwestern Marks. Uh, it is also a pleasure to collaborate with Emeric Monville. Uh, I should mention that his book on Michel Couscard, who's the speaker he was just discussing, is coming out with Iskra Books most likely in uh, July of this year. And so if people are interested in learning more about a form of French theory that's quite different from the dominant form that is promoted within the imperialist core, we strongly encourage them to read uh, Emeric's book. The way in which I thought I would frame my comments in relationship to the essay that I wrote on 68 in the French intelligentsia was in terms of the general category of bourgeois history. And what I mean by bourgeois history is the dominant way in which within the capitalist world, history is told. And this includes a number of different aspects, but one of the core elements of bourgeois history is an attempt to tame the radical nature of reality. Class struggle is what drives history, but bourgeois history attempts to make it look otherwise. In the words of Eduardo Galliano, whose book Upside Down I would strongly recommend, bourgeois history attempts to turn the world upside down. It endeavors to recuperate revolutionary history for its own ends. So histories of worker struggles from below and real gains for the proletariat become narratives of progress driven by benevolent measures taken by the bourgeois state, not concessions to class struggle, and they're usually primarily then centered around issues of rights and representation, not economic relations. The case of 68 is rather interesting in this regard because there would be very different ways of framing that time period from a historical materialist vantage point, and Emric mentioned some of these. I think that if we look from a socialist perspective at uh, what was going on in the wake of World War II, it is very clear that globally the socialist project was advancing and it was advancing through anti-imperialist struggles in the global south. And so one way of understanding 68 is instead the kind of anti-imperialist pro-socialist revolutionary transformations across the global south that characterized a large part of the 50s and 60s. Instead, bourgeois history attempts to take that impressive anti-imperialist series of decades of struggle and compress them into a single historical moment, 1968, or more specifically, May 68. This goes hand in hand with a spatial compression that is undertaken by bourgeois history, in which instead of seeing global anti-imperialist uprisings, you simply see something like the student movement in Paris in 68 or in at Columbia University for that matter in New York City in 68. And this also uh, is uh, further supported by the ways in which bourgeois history will privilege symbols over substance. So instead of foregrounding 68 as a major worker struggle, many people refer to it as the largest strike in the history of Europe, and as Emric just pointed out, this builds off of strikes that were going on in 67 and builds off of the history of the workers' movement within France and for that matter, more broadly within the world. What you have is the reduction of all of this anti-imperialist, pro-socialist activism to a student and youth-led revolt against the quote-unquote establishment. What the consequence of that is, is that instead of thinking about the 60s and 70s as an intense global anti-imperialist struggle within the overall ongoing advance of socialist state building projects, we are given a kind of insurgent third way, meaning neither capitalist nor socialist uprising 
On the part of the petty bourgeois stratum within the imperialist core, meaning within France, if we're speaking about that particular instance, which ultimately did not succeed in overthrowing the government, right? So a part of this bourgeois historiography that elevates 68 as the kind of great symbol of revolt of the last few decades is eradicating or attempting to erase all of the important anti-imperialist state building projects from the socialist vantage point and replace it with a kind of insurgent anarchism or what Enrique was referring to earlier as a kind of subjectivism, the glorification of subjective acting out that didn't succeed in ultimately transforming the government. Although, of course, the workers movement did within 68 um, obtain certain fundamental gains like a 35 percent rise in the uh, minimum wage, which was quite important. One of the reasons that I wanted to frame the article under discussion and the kind of themes under discussion in this manner is because for people of my generation, at least within the US and European context, for the most part, the high water mark of political radicality that at least was communicated to me was 68. There would be nothing higher than 68. I remember if it be the Occupy movement or even more recently with the anti-racist police terror kind of protests in 2020, there was a lot of discussion, both in activist communities and in intellectual communities about this being perhaps another 68. And it's interesting to think that that would be the touchstone. And for that matter, within the academy, the most radical professors that I've had are all kind of new lefty 68 types. What's important to, I think, understand about this is the ways in which the promotion of 68 as the grand symbolic date obfuscates other important dates, which I'll get to in a moment, but it also tends to frame the history of class struggle in a very specific way. So 68 in Paris is often glorified, if not fetishized, but what is focused on is the student revolt against the universities, and for that matter, also against uh, the imperialist interventions uh, internationally. And there were certainly some of the motivations and orientations of the students that were absolutely commendable and things worthy of support. But there was also absolutely, as Emery just pointed out, based on Cluscar's analysis and that of others, a kind of petty bourgeois politics of revolt that was also very explicitly anti-communist. So that the orientation was, well, capitalism might be bad, but the alternative looks a lot worse. Therefore, we need some magical third way. And as I hope most of us know, third way politics has proven to be a politics that leads absolutely nowhere, except for it's, if it's to capitalist accommodation, because the material world that we are living within is a world in which there is a struggle between the socioeconomic system of capitalism and the emergent socialist world. And in that regard, the third way politics amounts to, at best, a kind of utopian socialism in which you project some idea of a possible world that has very little to do with the actual material world that we're living within. I think that that's important for framing 68 as well, because, and Emmerich also touched on this briefly, 68 in Paris is often juxtaposed to Prague 68. And that narrative is such that, well, you had this radical revolt in the West in which people were free and rising up and challenging power and the kind of new left ethos around that that's juxtaposed to a horrific totalitarian state in the East that just crushes any attempts at democracy, et cetera. And so this dominant narrative polarizes Paris in the West and Prague in the East. And what that narrative does is it evacuates the larger and broader context. Some of this context I just alluded to, which is the broad anti-imperialist struggles in, across the global South. But it's also important to note that Czech, the case of Czechoslovakia is quite unique because in 1938, France, which actually had a military agreement with Czechoslovakia in order to defend Czechoslovakia against the incursion of the Nazis, uh, basically gave the Nazis a uh, open gate to colonize Czechoslovakia, along with Great Britain and the United States. And so what's written out of 68 narrative concerning Prague is the fact that the Western imperialist powers gave Czechoslovakia to Hitler on a platter. Moreover, and this we could get into because of course it's a detailed uh, and, and complex circumstance, 
Enrique mentioned the fact that, yes, the way in which socialism was built in Eastern Europe was a consequence of the Red Army having liberated Eastern Europe from uh, feudal regimes, for the most part, prior to Nazi occupation, and then fascism. And then setting up as a response to the fact that the Western imperialist powers were setting up bourgeois democracies in the countries that they were liberating in World War II without inquiring whether or not the Soviet Union wanted to be a part of those negotiations for how governance in the post-war era would operate, the Soviet Union decided to respond in turn and set up socialist governments. And there are issues with that, and I think important problems that people have pointed out. At the same time, the intervention in Prague uh, was such that there were explicit uh, positions that were taken on the part of the Warsaw Pact countries to not use military force, and there were less than 100 people who were killed. Uh, this is not to excuse what was done or to take a hard position one way or the other, but just to provide a broader context for understanding that we can't simply go down the path of saying Paris was glorious, Prague was horrific, we have freedom in the West and students can, you know, build barricades and occupy universities. And in the East, all that you have is tanks in the streets and blood running um, uh, the bloodletting on the part of the Soviets. So I just wanted to highlight that, and I wanted to mention one other thing that is important for understanding 68, and that is the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive demonstrated that the U.S. Uh, military, the strongest military in the world at that point in time, was incapable of crushing the freedom struggle on the part of the Vietnamese that was led by the Vietnamese Communist Party, and that as a matter of fact, an underdeveloped, a structurally underdeveloped country from the history of imperialism was capable of organizing itself to such an extent that it could undertake a national liberation struggle that would push back and win against the most powerful imperialist army in the world at that point in time. So another way of contextualizing 68 is to say, well, clearly, I think historically and globally, the most important event in 68 if you were to rank things, would be what happened with the Tet Offensive, because it demonstrated that the Vietnamese were capable of organizing themselves for national liberation, and they were on course for defeating and would eventually defeat the U.S. military. It's by centering as well the issue of anti-imperialism in the global south that can bring to the fore the principal class struggles at that point in time, which is not to play a game of kind of just ranking different struggles, but to juxtapose the ways in which someone like myself, both in the academy and the activist world, has been trained that Paris in 68 was the radical revolt, as opposed to being told that, well, one of the high watermarks of global class struggle over the last few decades was the Vietnamese struggle for independence from imperialism. So with all of that broader framing in mind, I'd like to then turn in my final comments to the case of French theory more specifically, which is of course the focal point of this larger discussion. One of the things I think that's important to understand is that French theory, as it is understood as a social phenomenon, right? So it's not me saying this, but the way in which society has established uh, and particularly due to the ways in which these figures have been promoted by the US Academy and US capitalist interests, a coterie of thinkers that are affiliated with a new, radical, unorthodox way of thinking. People like Deleuze and Derrida and Lacan and Kristeva and Pierre Bourdieu for that matter. Uh, you could go on down a very long list. And that to understand the prominence of this particular type of French theory that's been globally promoted, you again have to situate it within the social totality and more specifically, within the social relations of knowledge production. What bourgeois history teaches us is that ideas generate ideas and that individuals are the driving forces behind history because they are the ones who are the progenitors of ideas. But that's not how history works. History works through class struggle, but also through the material relations of knowledge production that produce particular subjects that are trained to think and write and speak in particular ways. And those material forces also promote particular forms of knowledge production over and against others. So one of the arguments that I make in the particular, this particular article and some of the other work that I've been doing is that French theory understood in this more restricted sense is a product 
of US cultural imperialism. It was a result of, in the post-war era, an attempt on the part of the US empire to shore up the Western European countries within the capitalist stronghold through the Marshall Plan and through siphoning funds off of the Marshall Plan that were used for disinformation campaigns and propaganda campaigns by taking over unions, taking over political parties, but then also waging an intellectual world war in which they were promoting the work of anti-Marxist thinkers. Raymond Aron, A-R-O-N, would perhaps be the first and foremost insofar as he was the, uh, the kind of godfather, intellectual godfather, if you will, of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a CIA cutout and which was headquartered in Paris and had offices in some 35 countries, ran prestige magazines around the world. Aron also happened to be the intellectual mentor to Pierre Bourdieu, for whom he obtained his first uh, position at the university. And Bourdieu was the director of the research institute that Aron oversaw at the, uh, the EHESS, the OHSS, the Ecole des Études en Sciences Sociales. Um, in that regard, these are just some of the details, but the broader context here is that the US was keen on shoring up Western Europe within the capitalist camp and establishing a form of intellectual hegemony within the intelligentsia in which there was a war waged against Marxism and more specifically against forms of Marxism that supported the anti-imperialist struggles in the third world that I was just mentioning and supported state building projects on the part of socialists. So the Ford Foundation funded the major arrival of French theory within the United States, a famous conference that took place in Baltimore in 1966. And this was to the tune of over a quarter of a million dollars in 2023 dollars. Anyone who's organized a conference in the academy knows that you would be lucky to get $500, $1,000, maybe $5,000 to organize a conference, and you'd have to knock on many doors. If the Ford Foundation opens up its spigot and gives you that much money, it's clear that there is an endeavor involved, and I spell out some of, or, or sorry, an agenda involved, and I spell out some of that agenda in the question, in the um, article in question. So I'm not going to spell it out uh, here right now. But part of the promotion of French theory was the attempt in not only symbolically elevating kind of May '68 and the student movement, not the workers' movement, in May '68 as the most important kind of movement for recuperating radical insurgent energies within a framework of capitalist accommodation, that within that overall framework, there was also the promotion of intellectuals who were then affiliated with 68. And much of this affiliation simply has to do with chronology. The fact that in 1966, both Michel Foucault and Jacques Lacan published books that were more or less bestsellers and were very, very widespread. Um, and so in the readership was very, very widespread. And so the affiliation was that such that just as the students had stormed and occupied the Sorbonne, so was this new group of thinkers undertaking an unprecedented attack on institutionalized knowledge that was unorthodox, that was different, that was radical, and wasn't beholden to things like the old left or Marxism that's determinist and reductionist. And you, know, you can go on down the list with the other series of incorrect stereotypes. So part of the promotion of French theory qua 68 thought was an attempt to elevate a radical liberal theory that was opposed to Marxism. And that also had to do with kind of promoting a new left orientation over and against what's called and denigrated as the old left. So a politics focused on uh, class relations, but class relations understood as class struggles, as someone like Domenico Lasordo has detailed in uh, with remarkable lucidity in his book, Class Struggle, because for the deep Marxist tradition, the history of class struggles has always been a struggle for women's emancipation, has always been a struggle for national liberation and the liberation of races. And so class struggles need to be understood in this broad sense. And that's how the best elements of the old left have always understood it. And of course, we could get into the details of you know, who I'm thinking about and to what extent and at what points in time, because I'm focusing here more specifically on the kind of old left that's affiliated with the Third International and the consequences kind of uh, in, in post-Third International history of that uh, overall 
orientation. So the last thing that I wanted to say is that there is a kind of center of gravity that one can identify within French theoretical circles affiliated with French theory. And that, that center of gravity is sometimes hard to see because every single one of these thinkers markets themselves in terms of an idiosyncratic brand that is irreducible to every other brand. So if you're a uh, dyed in the wool Deleuzian, you will claim that Deleuze is radically different from Derrida, who's radically different from Levinas, and the Derridians and the Levinasians will highlight the specificities of their respective father figures. But what we have to do in relationship to these, this brand specificity is identify the fact that this is actually a product of the global theory industry, that the branding and the idiosyncratic nature of these discourses is in order to promote the commodities that they're selling. Brand Deleuze, Brand Derrida, Brand Levinas. And to drop the assumption that high culture functions in a different realm than low culture, right? So you could have a brand, you know, brand beers or brands of t-shirts, but you wouldn't have brands of thinkers. Uh, the only reason for that is because of the bourgeois ideology of the art that tries to separate high culture from low culture. But high culture within the capitalist world functions in terms of the same fundamental logic. So a big part of my work has been trying to bring to the fore the ways in which the core theoretical practice of this group of thinkers affiliated with French theory is such that they all endlessly promote their idiosyncratic differences in order to brand themselves and also in order to dissimulate the fact that what they share is a fundamental political orientation which is anti-totalitarian anti-communist ultimately, and I'd be happy to talk about the details if that sounds surprising in any ways. And I would include within this figures like Slavoj Žižek and Alain Badiou and more contemporary iterations, Jacques Ranciere, of this kind of French theory phenomenon. And they're opposed with almost no exceptions. There are a few that I could discuss if you wanted to, to actually existing socialist state building projects. So once you see that, it becomes very clear why French theory would be promoted by the capitalist ruling class within the United States and by the uh, elements of the bourgeois U.S. state in its cultural imperialist endeavors. I'll leave it there and turn it back over to you, Carlos. Wonderfully said, comrade. Um, I would like to open up the floor uh, for uh, both Americ and, and, and Gabriel to um, reply if they have any comments on, on each other's presentations. We can discuss uh, those for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes and uh, then perhaps turn to, to questions and, and audience questions. So. Oh, uh, sorry, America, I had to, I just unmuted you, so you can speak. Oh, uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, uh, for, for, for your talk, your, your wonderful uh, uh, advocate uh, uh, of this cause, uh, understand it better from a global point of view, and especially the uh, um, U.S. maneuvers in order to, to take uh, control of uh, the so-called French theory. Even in France, we say it in English, French theory, because it was coined in the, in the U.S. in a way. And it's, of course, it's not la théorie française, it's, it's a normal, uh, it doesn't mean anything special, la théorie française, but French theory, it's this kind of, uh, of, uh, of maneuver, of, uh, of strategy. Maybe uh, all was uh, really and, and enthousi I was enthusiastic hearing you. Maybe I thought we, if I was not hearing everything, uh, um, um, may, but maybe you, you don't, maybe you mentioned it before, but I think we should, um, the way of that critical, uh, the critics of uh, 1968 in France, especially, but I think in the US too, uh, have led to uh, a kind of a new conservative. Uh, they took some parts, some very parts. It was completely they, they cut off all the uh, the Coscardian Cusca, critique, but from a very right point of view, uh, th thinking that we could um, the the good old past of the uh, the traditionalist values uh, and and so on, and without uh, speaking about all the the capitalistic crisis, and but it's completely contrary to to what, for instance, because he knew that it was a process uh, 
a capitalist process of crisis that was irremediable. There is no turning back from the from this point of view. And in a way, I, I'm very surprised how Kluska was it like Gramsci was with the with the new right in uh, in France. It does. It, it was the same strategy to take some parts from it, from from Gratchist theories about the intellectuals, in order. Uh, uh, let's even uh, Margaret Thatcher was trying to 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 pick up some uh, some some little uh, um, uh, explanations of, of Gramsci about the intellectual power. But uh, of course, it, it, the entire life of Gramsci had nothing to do with Thatcherianism. But it's a bit the same that we are uh, living today, and uh, it's, it's especially in the in the U.S. Of course, we are following the uh, the, 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 the enormous impact on uh, on uh, uh, on imperialism uh, 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 the world. And of course, uh, I would. I'm not so uninterested by uh, a kind of isolation, but of course uh, there's a part of the right in the US that is isolationist. To a rather extent, I don't know uh, where it stops, where it begins, but uh, of course I prefer people who don't want to make uh, war on Russia uh, now, <laughs> maybe later, or maybe with China, I don't know. So I, I don't have any... I don't want to comment uh, on, on it, but uh, I, I saw that the, these um, this struggle between uh, C and Coke, uh, Coca Cola in the in the U.S. between the, the Democrats and the Republicans don't don't lead to anything good. But uh, uh, it's the, the, we have to to struggle against these false critiques in the um, I think in the um, uh, which which are part of the social progress in this we have to, to be very cautious in in uh, analyzing it there are some parts of revolution there are some parts of reaction socialism uh, it's it's what in a way the the operation of the of the US making three theory a major uh, control uh, currents was very shrewd very very shrewd uh, with promotion of abstract modern art uh, I, for myself, am uh, a big fan of uh, abstract modern art. But to, to impose it was uh, it was meant in a way of um, uh, making a cultural war. There are lots of, of books on this uh, on these topics, um, and you, you, you know, I um, uh, in Paris they had for for instance uh, Nicolas Nabokov. Of, who was a very brilliant uh, intellectual, and uh, he was sent, um, especially in, in Paris, in order to to, because at this moment France was was really uh, had the intellectual influence. It uh, it uh, it was. Um, I I think uh, we, maybe we we forgot it because uh, from now on, since we are we our, our governments consider. The, themselves as a uh, some more, uh, it's lose a lot of prestige. But at this moment, it was really key. key. Like for uh, and if I make this comparison with French uh, uh, art, it's important. There, there was the school of Paris was, uh, with Picasso, with uh, Nicolas de Stal. Uh, it, it was especially important. Uh, and especially because these these uh, this painter at this moment were, were not in a, in uh, uh, some motos of uh, abstractionism. They, they they was creating new new ways of uh, expressing uh, social life. For, for 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 instance, it was necessary to to get there and to impose a, a, a new some of them. For 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 instance, ju just to 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 express myself. I have to explain myself. Nicolas de Stal uh, used all the um, the acquisitions of uh, abstract uh, art, uh, uh, put it in a new way of um, of making a representation. But with, with all the 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 the, the gifts, uh, with all the the notions he knew from uh, from us ab uh, abstract model, something else. But with 
uh, action painting, for instance, the, the US wanted to, to to impose something very much more abstract, uh, much more uh, te te technocratic in a way. There was a struggle in, in even since because you had some uh, uh, modern music that was linked with the with the circles of the, the Italian uh, Communist Party, for, for instance, with with Gino, you know, and but. Uh, they imposed Tokhausen with a, a very much about etc. 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 It was, in a way, it was absolutely brilliant. I'm not sure that today they have this, the same capacity uh, to do it. Uh, I think that French theory was the the, the last the brilliant. Uh, of course, we can we can see uh, how how it worked, and uh, of course they they used the all the. Um, the, 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 the notions, all the, the knowledge that was, uh, uh, which, which not, uh, which is not a minor uh, current, it was in a way, uh, it revolutionized uh, the thought. But what is important to be, um, um, uh, look, uh, sorry, I, I have to, to um, yeah, in, in France, the, they, they theorized the the, the the passage from a structure uh, to 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 another. It was generative. Uh, they they called it uh, structuralism, but it was in a way to 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 reconstruct uh, the capacity of Marxism to to evolve uh, from a structure to 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 to, to another. In in a way to to, to think. it was Lucien Goldman, for instance. Lucien Goldman was the thinker. Of this uh, capacity to 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 think it, and um, but uh, of course uh, that's why they they impose much more rigid uh, conception of the of the structure, and uh, um, I I I think in, in a way it's um, when you have gen genetical structure. Structuralism refined uh, the the dialectical uh, uh, Marxism, the the, 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 the dialectics, uh, dialectical materialism. Um, okay, my, my, I'm not so it's in English, uh, um, and maybe you will hear me better because I'm not sure that the the yeah some of the the audition is good. Uh, in Paris, I will uh, I will prepare it for 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 an hour. Yeah, Carlos. Yeah. What was that, Gabriel? Yeah, the the sound was cutting out a bit, but there are a few comments that I did hear that I'd love to respond to because Emmerich made yeah. a number of important points. One at the that I think is significant at the kind of level of the big picture is that with the evolution of the imperialist core in the wake of World War II, we were in a situation in which the former imperial powers had lost much to the war and the US emerged as the dominant imperial power. And we know a lot of that kind of military and political history, but that also meant that it took on the role of being the dominant cultural power and exercising much more explicitly forms of cultural imperialism that have a deeper history, but became extremely explicit in the wake of World War II and that part of that cultural imperialism you see very clearly in the art world. In fact, a chapter of my book, Radical History and the Politics of Art, looks at this very explicitly. The role of the bourgeois state, and in particular, the intelligence services of the US bourgeois state in promoting New York over Paris as the center of cultural production and promoting abstract expressionism and forms of kind of subjectivist, masculinist art as being the highest level of artistic production, capable of rivaling the art of Europe. And so that whole transatlantic relationship between the former imperial powers in Europe and now the leading imperial power that is taking over the kind of cultural apparatus and then also using the former imperial powers as junior partners, right? Just as they're doing militarily and economically today. And Part of that history then also plays itself out in the history of French theory, but it's interesting the way in which it changes based on the particular context, because in the case of abstract expressionism, it was very explicitly about promoting U.S. art making and giving a global image to the U.S. empire as not the image of lucky strikes, 
bubble gum, and Coca-Cola. But instead, the image of Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning, and more broadly, uh, Faulkner and Hemingway, etc. This branding of the U.S. empire is a projection of a particular image that uses art and culture as a facade for the empire. And in that regard, I think that broader history is absolutely essential. And then to connect that more specifically to one other thing that Emmerich said is that the consequence for promoting French theory is, is interesting because then it's a matter of actually promoting intellectual work that's emanating out of Europe. And Arno Mayer has done really interesting work on the persistence of the ancien regime or the persistence of the old regime and the ways in which there are aristocratic forms of culture that continued under capitalism and were grafted onto capitalism in various ways. I think one thing that's absolutely fascinating and needs to be analyzed in greater detail is the way in which the old imperial powers, due to the fact that they've been developing capitalist culture for centuries, right, particularly within Western Europe, still maintain a certain level of credentials within the US. And so there's a reverence toward European theory, European art, European film, there's a kind of refinement that is identified with Europe. And in the case of French theory, what was promoted was this kind of very refined, very intricate form of French theory that multiplies endless references to bourgeois culture and operates at a level that a lot of the American theory in the early 20th century, for instance, simply wasn't operating at. And so it's a different configuration that I think is worth mining down into and analyzing in greater detail. And the last thing that I'd say is that the promotion of French theory has often, often had a remarkable influence on what's referred to as Western Marxism or cultural Marxism, in which within the imperial core, it's broadly assumed, at least within the academic and intellectual, and for that matter, even certain activist circles within which I've been trained, that you can take a discourse and a science, as well as a practical modality of struggle like Marxism, and combine it with different bourgeois forms of ideology, ultimately. And if this is Freudo-Marxism or Lacan and Althusser or other versions thereof, when you look at the dominant kind of radical thinkers that have been promoted within the imperialist court even beyond French theory, look at someone like Stuart Hall or look at obviously Negri and Hart or people like this. These are figures who take Marx and then they bleed into Marx, Lacan and Deleuze and these other major references from French theory as if this form of intellectual eclecticism advances to a higher level of understanding. And what it actually does is it traffics in the basic mechanisms of the symbolic economy of the global theory industry. If you have a little bit more Deleuze or a little bit more Lacan, it's much more refined, it's much more sophisticated, it sounds nicer to the ear. You know, it's basically like refined music or refined champagne or refined perfume for that matter. What's lacking is the substance of the analysis. And I'll give a shout out to the great Walter Rodney. who said, well, you know, these people who mix Marxism as a science of human liberation, right? This is an important science. It's not like a science amongst others where you can just dabble in a few other things and combine it at will. These people who do do that, these eclectics, what they're doing is they're mixing things up because ultimately they're not headed anywhere. They do not have an agenda that consists in transforming the world for the benefit of the masses of humanity and for that matter, planet Earth. And if that is your agenda, meaning a kind of bourgeois symbolic politics of referentiality, then you can combine things at will and be eclectic because you're not headed anywhere. And I think that has had an enormously negative impact on intellectual developments in the imperialist core and more broadly given the cultural imperialism of the imperial core. And so it's true that today French theory, many people would think, well, this sounds like the 80s and 90s, like old Derrida and Deleuze, but you can go through the list of the major intellectual trends of the early 21st century and they traffic in the exact same types of orientation and they do the same types of things. If it be Afro-pessimism or liberal queer theory or decolonial thinking, and many of them trace their roots back to French theory or German critical theory or various forms of Italian theory that are not 
the revolutionary Marxist orientation. So I'll leave it at that. And oh, one question that I did have, but I'll leave it up to Carlos if he wants to uh, move on in the conversation. Emmerich is incredibly well positioned to talk about a different form of French theory, not the French theory that is marketed globally, but the French theory that is produced within the language of French that is not broadly translated, but that is doing work that is incredibly important to the science of human liberation that I mentioned a moment ago. So I don't know if, Emeric, if you want to share a few thoughts about the kind of alternative French theory, of which I would put you in that category, as well as the kind of work that you do as an editor with Edition Delga and a lot of the authors that you work with. But Carlos, you're our moderator, so I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, yes, please. That was actually uh, one of the questions that uh, I, I had planned out. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, feel free to, to speak about this alternative tradition that, uh, of course, is uh, largely forgotten, untranslated, overlooked, etc. Uh, excuse me, I, I was not to have, to have heard all the questions. It was a bit cut off. You you talked about the the possibility of an, an alternative theory. Is is that true? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, very, very. I think uh, I think I forgot to to tell you. I think that we uh, from our part from the, the workers' movements and for the thinking th theory of the workers' movements. We had a big lack in these 60s, from the 60s. It was the lacks of di dialectics of nature. Because just in the 50s, just a bit after the war, there was the Lysenko affair. And of course, there was a lot of errors during this period. This time, from this period, a lot of Marxists, Marxists didn't want to say anything about uh, about science in general, because they were afraid, they were shy, and they thought the social science was just uh, in, in, in order to solve economical problems, and they they completely lack the courage of uh, the defending uh, Marxism as all. Well point of view uh, as a dialectical mater materialism and of course maybe they, we had some some books from the USSR that was not really um, in a French uh, literal literature way because French and maybe was the the land of the the the, the Balzac of the Rosola the Flaubert the uh, uh, the art of, of and then the the us had great uh, uh, romances for, um, uh, writers of uh, of, um, of novels uh, but what that was the, the literature uh, land and of course the, there is a way of uh, present which is very uh, a literature uh, way and of course uh, a lot of of people were amazed by uh, what was presented in, in the USSR, but there was a lot of interesting things. And in the, the problems in, in what we can call Western Marxism, and Western Marxism, the characteristics of Western Marxism is the 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 lack, the abandonment of a dialectic of nature. Uh, it means it was like uh, what Kozhev made with uh, with Hegel. It, it means that the uh, dialectics only comes with anthropology. They are on an ontological uh, ground. You had not, as a Marxist, you had no, nothing to say. I was very um, happy that you, Gabriel, uh, were interesting, in, interest, interested by the work of uh, Georges Gaston, which in France is the the, the, the major uh, prominent uh, thinker. Of um, of course, a lot of philosophers in France lack. A scientific background in order to 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 tackle on these uh, on these issues, but I think that was that was why we excel uh, uh, spread of all the the themes uh, structure from a part uh, uh, subjectivism in a way without without mixing without seeing the connection facts on a on an ontological. Uh, 
um, backgrounds. And that, that's why we were, we were too shy. And I think a lot of Marxist, Marxists are very shy. When, when it's, uh, I saw some physicians for that are good militants that are Marxists, but they don't want to, 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 to defend Marxism even in their field because they are too shy. And, uh, but it's too easy to, to, to be Marxist in, in, the, in the field proficient. You have to, to defend Marxism where you are. <laughs> we, in every, so we have to, to refine it as, as a global um, philosophical point of view. If you do, don't, Sophie, you, you, you have just some, 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 uh, some tools. It's just little tools in order to, to, to make rhetorics. And, but it was not, I, I mean, that's well against uh, French theory. The, 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 the main thing is in order to struggle for it, we don't, don't have only to, to critique it, to, to, to see all the flaws. But to uh, it's uh, to us to 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 uh, and for instance with the Lysenko affair we have to, to to with the epigenetics, which is completely new. Uh, I published a book of a, uh, a, fr a French bi bi biologist, uh, soon translated into in English, maybe in, by the same uh, publishing house. Uh, Iska, he told me. Um, it, 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 but it, it would be on a, on a ecology the, in the. He, he spoke about. He, he went on on the listen co affair and uh, he, 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 he advocates for for a new uh, approach to it to see exactly what what which mistake we did, we did. But I, I must West, uh, they refused the Darwinism uh, as well. That was so we. we we have to, but we don't have to be shy on this uh, on these issues, and uh, and go on. Um, That's such an incredibly important uh, uh, point, America, because the uh, the turn away that uh, you get with Western Marxism is not just a rejection of Marxism, Leninism, and actually existing socialism, but also a philosophical rejection of the roots of thinking about. Marxism as dialectical materialism, as a belt and strong, a worldview that has something very productive to say in every field of analysis and in, in nature and society and in thought, not just in uh, society. And what uh, Western Marxism has progressively done more and more is limit the sphere to which their Marxism can comment on. And um, I th I th the point about eclecticism is so important, and especially when connected to the topic of the dialectics of nature, because you begin to see that eclecticism uh, in the Second International already, which in many ways uh, uh, its flaws bleed into what ends up becoming the tradition of Western Marxism. But um, Gabriel, do you, do you have any uh, comments you'd like to give back to America? Well, just very quickly, I, I couldn't agree more uh, as well due to the fact that the Marxist analysis of the dialectics of nature and I know that you've done uh, at least one show with John Bellamy Foster and other people working in this vein, is absolutely essential to centering the ecological catastrophe that capitalism has, that capitalism has generated, and that this has to be in the forefront of our intellectual work and of our organizing. In fact, it is of such an extreme sort. I was just here in a hailstorm speaking earlier, so hopefully I didn't freeze or lock up too much, that the history of the imperial left or the left within the imperial core has often been one that's been marked by decisions that were generated out of the material relations within which the left found itself. So the, one of the major problems with the uh, Second International, of course, was the social chauvinism, which is largely generated out of the fact that Europeans were benefiting from the wages of colonialism and ultimately part of the leadership of the Second International then lined up on that particular position. If you relate that to what's going on today, you obviously have, there's an entire geopolitical framework that we'd have to unpack, but just to focus on one issue is the dialectics of nature uh, is such that the global catastrophe of the environment 
is affecting people around the world and changing the material nature of their existence, regardless of whether or not they live in the imperial core or within the global periphery. In that regard, it's also a really fundamental touchstone for bringing people into the struggle. If you look at what socialist projects have done for struggling for the environment, the successes are resounding. If you look at what capitalism has done, it has built a high-speed train that is headed directly into a concrete wall. And if we do not get off those tracks and change the direction of that train, it's the end not only of life on planet Earth, most likely, but certainly of humanity, according to bodies like the United Nations, right? And so centering the dialectics of nature is absolutely important for the reasons that you and Emily both highlighted, but I'd also like to center the centrality of it as a galvanizing issue for activism within the imperial core. The last thing that I'd say is that it's interesting the way our conversation has evolved because we're slightly of different ages, but we share a kind of generational formation. And one of the, I think, roles that we need to play is re connecting the thread, meaning that the communist movement of, you know, going back to the early part of the 20th century, when you look at if it be 1917 or the 1920s or the 1930s, these were absolutely central revolutionary struggles. And that a lot of what happens with the fetishization and the promotion of the new left of 68, of intelligentsia affiliated with the 68, is an attempt to sever that thread, to make it look as if Knowledge functions in terms of a progress of sophistication in which shedding the dialectics of nature, shedding Marxism-Leninism, uh, bringing in kind of this bourgeois referentiality of French theory all means that things are somehow going in the right direction. I think on the contrary, a lot of that work has severed, has cut the threads to this deeper Marxist tradition and that if we want to be serious about fighting and winning, we need to reconnect to that thread not to simply be nostalgic or to, you know, try to return to yesteryear, but to have as our date, not 1968, but let's say 1917 or 1919, the founding of the Third International or other major dates within that history or 68 meaning the Tet Offensive, as I mentioned earlier, and give us our own proletarian history that is not dictated by the bourgeois history that's trying to, at times, very in a very coy fashion, uh, provide us with historical reference points that ultimately cut us off from this deeper history of revolutionary Marxism. I couldn't agree more, um, but I wanted to uh, switch real quick to a question from the audience. Uh, this is from uh, KP Jen. Uh, can the critique of French 1968 be applied to the 60s in the U.S.? And um, I would uh, perhaps uh, add a little, a, bit, a little bit of the context, which is that you know, the critique that you're providing isn't simply of the 68 uh, thinkers as this sort of historical commodity fetish um, of the real 68 movement, but you're also opening the space for thinkers like Cluscard and others from this alternative tradition in France um, that have been critical of the uh, trends that Lesordo describes as populists that are in, engaged in a more spontaneous, uh, anarchistic, anti-party, anti-authority form of political practice that's grounded in terms of class position in the development of this new middle class post uh, Marshall Plan. Um, and it, that represents really a, a phenomenon that uh, um, the general secretary, the former general secretary of our party here, uh, Gus Hall called petty bourgeois radicalism. And that's something that, uh, I an analysis that has been fundamental for, for our institute understanding the middle class radicalism that uh, we see in the left today. So um, how do you see that critique of 68 that comes from that uh, tradition of Cluscard and, and other communists apply not just uh, to the U.S. as a, a phenomenon that's global in character, but also to, to our current context. And how can you sort of decompress, because uh, I, I really like the phrase that you use, Gabriel, it's, it's a temporal and spatial compression of 68. How can we decompress that? And uh, is are any parts of that analysis um, uh, can they can they still apply to today's France and uh, today's uh, uh, U.S.? Should I go ahead and jump in? It's a great question, and I like the way you fleshed it out, Carlos, as well as Gus Hall. Of course, that that uh, piece in particular is very important, and his work in general. Couldn't agree more. 
I'd say two things. The first is that the nature of the critique that I've undertaken in this particular essay, and for that matter, it's related to a book project, uh, some of the chapters of which we've discussed on Midwestern Marx. My modality of critique is that the kind of radical tendency uh, to engage in critique for critique's sake is an impasse. And my orientation is that critique needs to be grounded in a positive project. That's the whole point of critique, is not to dwell in the land of critique and to be mightier than thou and you know, present one's views as somehow superior to that of others, but to actually have a positive project that's grounding that critique. And the positive project is the ongoing elaboration of a Marxist uh, orientation that has not only developed I think the most sophisticated and clarifying tools of social analysis, but also has proven itself practically again and again capable of alleviating the pain, suffering, and exploitation of the masses of humanity. And so in that regard, the critique of French theory is in relationship to the need to promote the types of theory that Emeric Monville does, that people like Georges Gasteau do, that people like, um, and maybe you could put this in the chat, uh, Emeric has worked a lot, and I think still does, with Edition Delga, and their publication uh, tradition is fantastic. This work should be translated, should be widely available, because it is the type of work that is engaging in this positive tradition, because Marxism isn't some, you know, dogma. It is an ongoing collective science in which there are struggles and there's, a, you know, different forces pulling in different directions. So sorry for the long proviso, but to get to the second point, which is really the heart of the question, I think that a lot of what we're talking about speaks very directly to the impact of culturalism and identitarianism within the Western left. By culturalism, I mean an attempt to shift politics away from class struggles, understood as Lesordo elucidated within the Marxist tradition. These are struggles that have always been about women's liberation, racial and national liberation, and about liberation from class oppression, including national liberation, which is the liberation of nations subjected to imperialism. Those forms of class struggle were the real focal point for the Marxism of the Third International and various strands that have continued those traditions in the wake of the Third International. In the new left, what you have is, and I'm going to speak in broad terms, obviously there are some details and nuances we could get into, but in general, an attempt to pivot away from class struggles in the direction of cultural politics and identitarianism. That cultural politics means that what should be first and foremost is a struggle around race that is somehow unmoored from class struggles about capitalism or a struggle around gender or sexuality or other forms of identity that are somehow unmoored from the social totality of class struggles, which at an intellectual level is nonsensical because women are positioned within the social totality in which there are relations of production. And within those, they have been made subordinate, super exploited and oppressed. We need to explain all of that. We can't siphon off from it a particular identity or set of identity claims and then just focus on those. And the proof is in the history of what those culturalist orientations have done. And Adolf Reed Jr., I think, has done the best work on this, where he's demonstrated that this culturalist orientation ultimately amounts to a class politics, but a class politics of a very different sort. It's the class politics of the petty bourgeois managerial stratum that wants to weaponize particular identity categories for their own ends so that they can advance their careers as a black artist, as a female artist, as an African-American intellectual, as this, that, or other category, because within the capitalist apparatus of knowledge production, these forms of identitarian culturalism work seamlessly with capitalism because they allow for individual competition within this kind of broad stratum of the professional managerial class while simultaneously invisibilizing the important class struggles on the part of workers from below. And so the new left is in many ways the beginning for what would become identity politics and multiculturalism in the 80s and 90s and what you see in the 21st century as wokeism. And you know people will use different terms for this, but what we have to do is like bracket 
all of this symbolic epiphenomena and look at the core mechanisms that are operative. The core mechanisms consist in a pivot away from class struggles in the name of a culturalist politics that serves the interests of the professional managerial class, particularly within the imperialist core, and particularly amongst those within the colonial periphery or the, the global periphery who aspire to the goods, services, and standing of those in the imperialist core. And so part of the culturalism and the identity politics, it's a cultural imperialist project through and through. All you have to do is look at all the Cuban artists who have been promoted within the United States, and it's absolutely blatant. And then you look at all the Cuban artists who have been disappeared or, you know, invisibilized within that framework. And the same goes for writers and intellectuals, et cetera. So there's a lot more that could be said about this. I'd love to go on at length, but I feel like I've said enough. So I'll pass it back. I think that's a that's a wonderful point. And it reminds me of uh, Georg Lukács' analysis that um, apologetics for capitalism, specifically after 1848, has to take the form of an indirect apologetics. And the most successful way to do that is to make the critique of capitalism very culturalist, to ground it in an eternalizing understanding of historically contingent social relations. And uh, that is archetypical of this move of the new left and of Western Marxism. But uh, Americ, your, your comments? Oh yes, um, I, 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 it was a bit cut off, but I I, um, I saw the the question uh, uh, about our, uh, our program, and he, he said, "If can can we compare French sixty eight to to the sixties in the U.S.?" Uh, as far as I know, because I, I I'm not very uh, uh, Sure, but what we had because it had it had an impact on uh, on French uh, society, of course. And I think we had contradictory um, messages from this culture in the the US, the American culture, and this was a huge movement, uh, anti-imperialist mo movement, anti anti-war. Uh, for for the people, it was much more anti-war than anti-imperialism because this word was too much Leninist. But it was something something great, something uh, huge. The war of Vietnam had had the 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 name of uh, Gus Hall. I had uh, 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 all my thoughts. We we have a the French communist have a great respect for for him for all the especially for, for the American communists during the, those years in the the U.S. was. Uh, was very courageous. Uh, that's all this um, this framework, but uh, at the same time, the, the the impact of the American in the French it was um, linked with the rock and roll music, with uh, with drugs, with uh, sex, drug and rock and rolls. I can say I will not critic sex. Without sex, we we the, you won't have any birth in the world. That's not an ideology as as a um, uh, as a production uh, ideology or things like that, and it it was a motto of the, the new new capitalism. I, I think sex, work, drugs, and rock and roll. It was I th think like uh, fascist time. The the motto of the the Italian fascist was credere uh, uh, to to believe, to obey, and to fight. It was the the the, the three the three things to do. But with neo capitalism Capitalism, you have to, that was a, a, a you have to 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 take it seriously. It was a it was a way of life that a way of life that they, they tried to impose to to the youth uh, all over the world. Uh, for my side, I, I prefer study, study, and study. <laughs> I think it's better. I I find it very interesting, especially today. Uh, I, I think that. If this phenomenon, which a big part of the left and the U.S. specifically hesitates to critique, uh, the phenomenon of, of, of wokeism, uh, they hesitate because it's uh, the way that it's critiqued in mainstream politics is done by uh, right-wing Republican politicians that are their critiques are grounded in bigotry and not in uh, in an understanding of the systematic ideological role that wokeism plays today to legitimize not just capitalism but imperialist operations abroad. There's no narrative that empire tries to spin every time it's attacking and, for, and bringing hybrid warfare against a specific country. The, the, the narrative conjoint with that, specifically for the liberal 
uh, parts of the inhabitants within the belly of the beast, it's always somehow tied to there's a minority of uh, Uyghur Muslims that we have to go save from China who's doing a genocide. There's no proof for it, but uh, the minority narrative is important. The same thing with Cuba um, and the discourse around these artists that um, if you follow the money, you know that they've gotten more than $2 billion in the last two decades from the NED, USAID, and the State Departments. But they're Black artists and Cuba suppressing Black artists, and so they're racist. The same thing in Venezuela with the LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't critique wokeism today, your analysis of uh, bourgeois ideology is one-sided and your war of positions is going to be one-sided. Half of uh, uh, half of bourgeois ideology, which is, I, I think, today the most successful half, uh, you won't be able to analyze. And um, I think that when you look at its philosophical roots, its philosophical grounds, the worldview of, of a lot of this uh, woke identity politics masquerading itself as radical and left-wing, it has very similar philosophical assumptions to old school reactionary racist worldviews, which is grounded on a deep tribalism that considers that what is essential is not the common humanity that people have and that uh, distinctions of nation, race, sex are all accidental properties, but what is essential is really those identitarian distinctions. And uh, that is at its core, a philosophical approach to the world that is just a liberal or a quote unquote progressive uh, mode of the same old school racist attitude. And, you know, you have to fight it, not just because it's the liberal wing of empire, but because the philosophical assumptions are deeply, deeply, deeply reactionary. Um, and their their outcomes could be a whole lot scarier than the liberal form that they're taking today. That's a really great, great point, Carlos. I'll just say something really quickly, and that is that in order to critique it, you have to also have to understand how it's been generated. And it is true, if you look at the history of a country like the United States, this is a relatively recent phenomenon. If you go back even to my grandparents' generation, you don't have this kind of woke, woke tribalism, right, that Carlos is referring to. And so it begs the question, why is it that the U.S. empire has... Uh, trafficked in these forms of identity politics at a particular point in time. And I think a part of that has to do with just the history of empire and the history of struggles from below. Because it is true that uh, the U.S. empire has, you know, globally had an enormous impact on civilizations around the world. Its demographics have changed due to its imperial endeavors, Right. The fact that we have you know, various ways of immigration at different class levels, this all has to do with the history of US empire. And that also has to be conjoined with struggles on the part of people. Some of those struggles, I think are absolutely legitimate. Struggles for access to political power, to representation and things like this. And so given the fact that the empire is not just the white settler colony that it was, for instance, in the early 19th century, but is instead a white settler colony that has engaged in global empire building that makes it such that its population, including its professional managerial population, is much more diverse than it was in the past. How do you deal with that? Well, you manage it. And you manage it precisely by using that mixed population in order to recuperate and transform what was partially driven by struggles from below into this kind of tribalism that Carlos was referring to. And I think also that materialist analysis of the history of imperialism and how it's produced these particular phenomena needs to be centered in those discussions because then we see that it's material history that's ultimately driving these phenomena. And that woke ideology is a consequence of those material struggles and an attempt to recuperate this imperial history and the struggles from below for very, very nefarious ends. And I couldn't agree more with the fact that this is also one of the principal imperial tools that's used by the US if it's supporting so-called eco candidates or indigenous candidates around the world. All of this is just basically using woke identity politics as a way of pursuing the imperial project. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yes, and uh, just to bring up a, a quick point, because you've referenced Lasordo's uh, Class Struggles a couple of times, and it's such an important book. Um, and, uh, 
there's this idea that these people uh, uh, propose, which is that if you reject this or if you reject intersectionality or whatever bourgeois theory that passes itself off uh, as radical, um, you're rejecting uh, the struggle against racism, against sexism, against national oppression. And it's complete uh, BS. Um, the famous dictum is uh, uh, the history of hit earth or existing uh, societies is history of class struggles. It's plural. There's no such thing as a pure form of class struggles. Class struggles is a universal that as all universals within the dialectical tradition, it has to be concrete. It's a rooted universal and it has to take always a particular form. And the particular form that it takes sometimes is the struggle against racism, the struggle against sexism. Of course, Engels says the first class struggle is a struggle against patriarchy. Um, sometimes it's national uh, struggles for liberation. So these are all determinate forms of class struggles. They're not separate things from the struggle of of, uh, of, of labor against uh, capital. Um, and the terminology that Lasorda brings up in that text of genus and species is, I, I, I think, very good to, to highlight that. But um, I, I wanted to uh, maybe switch gears to a comment that um, that uh, your your comment about uh, settlers uh, is a good segue for. Um, Kluskard and other communist theorists, such as our very own uh, Henry Winston, had noticed that uh, for Western Marxists like uh, Marcuse and his cohorts in France, the revolutionary agent is no longer the working class, whom they see as having been absorbed into the capitalist system. Revolutionary agency instead is transferred to the students or to the middle class consumers, or if uh, you're by due, it's transferred into like some weird form of third worldism or immigrants, uh, you know, it's, it's anything but the uh, proletariat. Um, there are growing trends in the US today, uh, in today's uh, US left, uh, which reduce working people to settlers um, and that understand the American uh, project in its current context as if it was, uh, you know, uh, 1780 or something. And instead of thinking of white workers as workers, um, they, they think of them as, uh, as settlers. Um, I see this as a new, renewed form of this same general move by the Western Marxists away from thinking of the working class as a revolutionary agent, because what ends up happening in a lot of these key theorists is that the most enlightened ones are usually the petty bourgeoisie or even the liberal wings of the bourgeoisie um, that are more attuned to the woke forms of uh, discourse than, uh, say, parts of the working class that are in the Rust Belt region and, and voted for Trump. So these people are described as settlers or, in the words of comrade uh, Hillary Clinton, as a basket of deplorables. And unfortunately, this discourse um, is is more popular than you would think in the U.S. So is this is this similar in, in France? And uh, if so, how how is it being combated? Yes, you, Carlos, you, you, you must taking, and in order to, to add something to, to what you say, uh, just take into account that uh, to some, in his last, uh, latest book, he talked about as, uh, a band, uh, as a bunch of fascists. It was, uh, in fact, it was uh, it was difficult to say if somewhere right or left. It was a bit difficult, but it was so far anymore from the the um, the pressure, uh, the, the financial uh, pressure against them. So, uh, Badiou is the is the the heir of all the French theory because it was man of this uh, period. It was the second. We in, in French we say second knife. I think. I think you do, you don't uh, you don't have this expression, but it means the uh, the man which uh, comes uh, comes along and now. But he he still plays his role in a way. Is he always uh, advocates uh, the European Union, which is uh, destructing, uh, uh, destroying all our uh, social conquests? He's here to say that the yellow vests are pure. He's a Pujadist. But it was a, it was a way of reviving a soft 
uh, attempt of fascism in in France. It's, 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 of course, it's not all the fascism, but it's very clear when he, uh, which well it comes about. I think w w you mentioned the wokeism and the identity politics. We are very afraid uh, in France about this. Uh, in our history, there is a lot. Uh, France is. I think the, there's a lot of historians who can confirm it. France is the only state where you don't have a people who create an, a state. You have a state, uh, and that means because um, it's it's not uh, the French don't have an ethnic conception of their nation. They have a political conception of the nation, and especially the reference to Of course, it's a bourgeois concept, but. Uh, all is equal in front of the law, and uh, it's something we hate in France. Uh, identity, communitarism, communitarism is something that we see as English. It's something that we hate because France could, if you apply all the ethnic uh, judgments, you, uh, there's no France. You have some Bretons, you have some Basque, you have some Occitan you have some uh, German speakers yeah it doesn't exist anymore there's no France because for, for, for the Frenchman France it means French Revolution it means uh, uh, an entire uh, uh, Jacobin in France and of course they, they hate identitarianism because they, they think it's a threat to, uh, to 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 revolutionary values of the French Revolution, uh, I saw the, the the end of the USSR. I saw I saw that after the, the the Russian Revolution, there will be the end of the French Revolution. They want to destroy my my country as they wanted to destroy Yugoslavia, USSR. Identity politics is, is the major threat because of course when someone is attacked because he. Is Jew because he's, a, he's black because she's a woman. Of course, I, I will be o uh, always ready to 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 defend them. And of course, you have to to def if you're different, you have the right to defend this. But you have also to defend the right to be to indifference. You have the right to say, I'm just a, a human being. I apply for this job because I, I'm I'm proficient. I'm competent the, 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 for it because my what I know, my, my profession, uh, you have to defend both. Right to difference when, when you're attacked and right to indifference in everyday life. And I think it's a very it's something very, I think, right, to, 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 to the Americans because uh, in American history, you had a, a lot of community uh, politics. It was meant like it. It was very difficult to get away from this uh, way of thinking. Identity politics in the U.S. It it reminds me that they're the, the thinking like that. The the, uh, the American way of life is is describing people as members of com com community, uh, even if it's in order to uh, take away from this division in. Uh, uh, it's it's difficult to to have this republican uh reference and i, I think there's something that's to defend secularism secularism it is it, is a very french idea i, I think maybe I, okay i i completely agree that french is also uh, an imperial state uh, with a lot of uh, of problems especially for the other peoples but we we could in our history we could defend some some, some rights or in in our country especially and because we had this republican secularism state of mind of of course, if you you claim as a Catholic as a Protestant, you can uh, uh, feud some uh, some some civil war uh, in France. Uh, in France, when for instance, when you're a teacher, you don't have to mention that uh, to, to which you don't have to say that you are an atheist, a Catholic, etc., etc. You, because you teach, you 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 concentrate yourself on what you teach. You are indifferent. To, to to this and the state is indifferent to uh, really and I'm very afraid because I think that my country could explode could be destroyed in the, in this next century if we accept 
this reduction uh, of uh, all the possibilities of mankind to this uh, struggle of and in a way it's a, it's an heritage of uh, the french theory of this uh, wokeism and uh, and so on it, it has a strange link but i think gabriella will be very very more uh, much more uh, much more better than i can do I, I'm not sure, but I, w I did want to touch on uh, one element that I do think is important, and that is, obviously, we began the conversation around 68 and the French intelligentsia, and we've been talking a lot about identity politics and wokeism, but I think it's really important to see these all of a part, because one of the ways in which identity politics, particularly within the U.S. context, has given itself intellectual credentials is by affiliating itself with French theory and other iterations within the kind of Western rad lib intelligentsia. And what you have within the case of French theory is this promotion of difference under various different guises. And everyone has their own brand concept for that. So it can be différence for Derrida with an A, it can be le différent for Lyotard, it can be the absolute other for Levinas. You know, uh, with Deleuze, he was constantly changing his vocabulary. So it was difference early on. And then it was a whole series of other concepts like deterritorialization, et cetera, later on. But one of the central driving mechanisms is this idea of paying homage to radical differences that can never be captured within the concepts and words that we have. And a difference so radical that it could not be captured within something like a dialectic because dialectics is bad because what dialectics ultimately does is it reduces difference to sameness. This is like, uh, I mean, I don't want to be uh, mean to children in this regard. Uh, I was going to basically say that this is like a child trying to think what dialectics is, but children are actually much more intelligent and more creative than that. Um, so I don't know what the equivalent would be, but you get the point. Dialectics is not about reducing otherness to sameness. And what you see within this very framework is the highly Kantian and pre-dialectical nature of the way in which so many French theorists approach these issues and an overinflation of this form of difference that could be not even be conceived or thought or articulated. So you endlessly have to rewrite your discourses because you can't even fit this infinitely complex form of difference within your thoughts, it ultimately then also leads to forms of metaphysics in which the difference that is the real difference is this absolute difference that could never be captured. And all of this theoretical enterprise has then been harnessed in order to lead in, lend intellectual credibility to identity politics. And a big part of that project has also been about denigrating class analysis across the board. And it's quite remarkable because many of the, the thinkers within the French theoretical tradition are profoundly disingenuous because they make reference to Marx and Marxism or a certain Marx, a Marx who thinks basically like they do. Well, at the same time, their fundamental discursive, intellectual, and political orientation is anti-Marxist through and through. And if you read their entire corpus from start to finish, their entire biographies, and situate them historically, it becomes very, very clear. And it's one of the things that I've been trying to do with my work. Uh, someone like Deleuze said very clearly, all revolutions fail. He went through a list of every single one, and a confusing list. Obviously, Deleuze did not know history very well. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Algerian Revolution, the Russian Revolution, all of these, as if there's no difference between bourgeois revolutions and socialist revolutions, colonial revolutions and anti-colonial revolutions, they all just fail across the board. And Deleuze also says that there's not two classes. It's a remarkable statement. What, you know, petty bourgeois navel gazing is that? There's only one class and then forms of flows and coding and decoding and all of this. And Derrida says the same thing. He says, I cannot formulate a coherent sentence with the word social class. As if the fact that an individual petty bourgeois French intellectual cannot think something or utter something means that humanity itself cannot either think social class or even more importantly, knows the lived reality of social class. 
And so a lot of French theory has been pitted against a class analysis, pitted against a dialectical analysis, and echoing some of the things that Carlos was saying earlier, I do think there are fundamentally retrograde elements within certain aspects of French theory. So much of what French theory says amounts to French theory in this sense that we've been talking about it, amounts to saying that there's this totalitarian way of thinking that's really bad, and you think you can understand something about the world and say something coherent about it. That's awful, that's reductivist, that's determinist. And there's this other way of thinking that consists in tailing forms of dis that always escape our concepts, always escape our words, and ultimately just kind of flies off into the metaphysical distance. And this is, is good. So you have a kind of orientation that is very clearly pitted against class analysis and materialism, and that also provides an image of the Marxist tradition that is fundamentally flawed. Uh, there are innumerable quotes that I could cite from Derrida, Deleuze, Levinas, forget about it, because he was a reactionary Zionist imperialist, so I don't even know where to start with Levinas, where they basically say that the entire Marxist tradition is economistic and deterministic and reductionist. Who are they reading? The answer is nobody. They haven't read the Marxist tradition. They don't know it. And they are grandstanding as petty bourgeois intellectuals who can proffer forth the dominant ideology of the Western imperialist world as if they were throwing pearls to swine, as if these were crystal clear ideas that everybody knows that everything about socialism is horrific. As Foucault said very clearly, everything in socialism is to be condemned. As Derrida said in his book, Spectres of Marx, in which he tried to do some fancy footwork in order to recuperate Marxism in the wake of its disappearance, apparently, uh, which would be news to the Chinese Communist Party and many other people around the world. And he says very explicitly that his entire life and work has been pitted against totalitarianism and everything that it stands for and everything affiliated with lived experience of socialism. So I just wanted to kind of connect some of this conversation on identity politics and wokeism to an attempt to lend it intellectual credibility by using this anti-communist and anti-Marxist metaphysical and anti-dialectical discourse in order to give it a kind of a fancy bourgeois veneer, if you will. And that is part of the larger kind of complex that I think a lot of the Western left suffers from. And fortunately, and hope that this has come through in some of the discussion, what we're proposing is not just a critique of that, but an antidote. Right, so the authors that Mon, uh, that Emmerich has mentioned, that Carlos has mentioned, that I have mentioned, these are authors who are part of a living collective tradition in which there are disagreements and there are debates and people are pushing and pulling in different directions. But there is a clear orientation towards the development of scientific tools of analysis and a practical engagement aimed at transforming the world in a more egalitarian and ecologically sound direction. And that's the tradition that we need to uplift. And we have to recognize what the obscurantists are doing in order to try to get that project off its tracks. Very, very uh, uh, well said. As usual, it, it all goes down to a, a, a statement or it could go uh, down to a statement that Engels makes in a letter to Conrad Schmidt, which is that uh, what all these gentlemen lack is dialectics. Um, and a lot of the times what they end up calling Marxism is a half-ass analysis uh, that's uh, anti-dialectical that they project onto uh, the Marxists. But um, I, I wanted to perhaps end, because we're about to hit the two-hour mark, on a um, somewhat of a more basic question that uh, I don't think is unimportant, but that should be addressed. And it's one that um, I get often asked by some of the older comrades um, that uh, I engage with, which is that you know, these, uh, these philosophical trends within the bourgeois academy uh, must be criticized, but um, what weight do they hold when it comes to practical organizing? Uh, do, do they trickle down into um, organizing uh, or, or organs of, of, of worker organizing? And how do they trickle down into, uh, you know, the general consciousness and culture of the people beyond just the niche group of scholars that read uh, these these French theorists or the Frankfurt School. I've postulated that there's a variety of institutions, NGOs, uh, 
the media and, and different ways for this to trickle down and that, uh, you know, in a very Gramscian sense to defeat its most coherent and elaborate form is essential for defeating the vulgarized forms that uh, they obtain when they hit the masses. But um, what would uh, you two respond to this statement that, uh, well, what we're really doing is just criticizing uh, folks who uh, are maybe being read by 15 other scholars in the academy and have no bearing on like uh, the working class's consciousness or something. I think it's a really important uh, question and we need to address it in terms that flesh out the social totality. And Carlos, I, I take it that you're doing that in your response because really the focal point is not so much French theory or an individual thinker or in my other work on German critical theory or various forms of the global theory industry. The focal point is the capitalist cultural apparatus, meaning the entire system of production, circulation, and consumption of ideas and worldviews within society, and how that capitalist cultural apparatus seeks to exercise hegemony over the masses on planet Earth, and that that is a process that takes place through various levels of mediation. And so the professional managerial class stratum of the intellectuals and the artists and the journalists and people who are in the kind of visible uh, spotlight of the uh, cultural apparatus are often people who are either experts or dilettantes in various discourses like the ones that we're talking about and some others. And so understanding the way in which that hegemony is not just produced by an apparatus that is a big, you know, almost like a stamp that just stamps itself on each individual subject, but it's structured in very specific ways. And part of that structuring is a class structure. And so people within the PMC stratum are the ones who are tasked with and given jobs in order to indoctrinate the rest of the population. And as educators, as journalists, as pundits, they exercise an enormous amount of influence over the masses and the nature of the debates that the masses are having. At times, those debates might appear to have absolutely nothing to do with French theory or highfalutin philosophic conversations or the dialectics of nature or things like this. People like us can unpack it because we can see the way in which these nested mediations operate and go back, as Carlos was saying, to kind of their source and the generative sources uh, of them. But part of the conversation that we just had demonstrates that you don't even need to do that because at one level, you can already see the very practical impact of so many of these discourses because in my activism, I've been based in the US for the last 15 years. And within the US context, which is my principal context for activism, wokeism and identity politics is absolutely everywhere. It is in the democratic socialists, the revolutionary socialists, the, the liberals, the conservatives, the reactionaries, and the fascists have their own version of white identity politics. It is everywhere. And it's the nature of the game. Therefore, we can have, and we should be able to have, conversations about the kind of higher philosophic elements that are ultimately producing the hegemonic discourses. And people like us are trained in order to be able to do that. So we should exercise our ability to do that. But of course, we need to keep in focus the fact that the real enemy isn't just the progenitors of these particular discourses. It is the material reality of those discourses as they manifest themselves in the real world. And so we have to be able to struggle at multiple different levels and on different fronts at the same time. And all of it depends on the nature of the confrontation, if you will. And one of the things that I think has been helpful about this, con this conversation is We've talked at a very broad level about issues that are very germane to contemporary organizing because it's about centering class struggles in the broader sense that we've been talking about in order to fight and win, not fight, not struggle, not get a little bit of representation, but fight and win around issues of exploitation and oppression concerning women, national and racial minorities or subjugated groups and the working class and the global working class. And in that regard, 
that needs to be the real focal point and we do need to develop very strong discourses against the dominant cultural apparatus which is indoctrinating people into the idea that leftism is wokeism and leftism is identity politics no it is not if we want to fight and win instead of just fighting for ourselves and advancing our career and our identity category within our particular class stratum then we have to get on board with a collective project and we have to build real power in order to be able to do that and that should be the real focal point while of course there are different struggles you know to win a war you got to fight a lot of different battles and those different battles we have to be able to intervene in them as best we can and at various levels therefore i think that we have to multiply the fronts of struggle if you will and hopefully this conversation has been in part at least a contribution to that wonderfully said uh com comrade Merrick, do you have any comments on uh um why it's important to, to criticize these uh, academic uh, tendencies and how they bleed into society at, at large. To, to what you, you, you mentioned, uh, Lenin theorized uh, the, the distinction between theory, propaganda, and agitation. And I think that's mostly our, our enemies, our capitalist enemies, who are using this a very, uh, in a brilliant way, but we, we must retake it. I think it needs more more gift, more genius to, to, to do the agitation thing or the propaganda thing. I think to, the thinking and the theory is maybe the, the, um, the most, uh, the easiest thing, but uh, of course you, you can't... Uh, uh, you, 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 you must, uh, you must go through, through that. It's, uh, it's because all is linked, uh, as uh, as Gabriel uh, um, uh, clearly explained it. And uh, of course, you, when you, we, we were talking about, uh, I don't know, the subtle things of uh, Jacques Lacan, but it had some uh, some impacts on our daily life. And in a very subtle way, but, uh, of course. And uh, even uh, even Badiou, uh, when I speak of him, I speak like uh, about uh, uh, the the diplomacy politic of of a state because it has an impact. Because uh, as the most uh, uh, translated uh, French uh, French thinker, and it was meant because the only the the publishing house, uh, uh, the English publishing house, had chosen him. A lot of Trotskyists. Uh, uh, took him uh, directly and refused to publish Kuskar, for instance, because it, it had an impact. It had an impact of the, the way of, uh, um, of, uh, of organizing uh, things in general. That's why I'm very uh, grateful that you're interested in all uh, the critics of the so-called French theory that is in the normal way, uh, French theory, but because I think it, it can it can change a lot of uh, perception in uh, in the U.S. and I'm I'm very grateful for for it and thank you very much, comrades. And I think that's a proof of um, the use of the international uh, solidarity. It's a lot. Thank you. Very very well said, and that's a really good point that you make there at the end. The the bourgeoisie wouldn't uh, be investing so many resources and. Uh, and so much money developing this if they didn't know that this muddling of the waters that uh, makes it harder for people to get and find the outlook that is going to give them ideological clarity and help them act in a revolutionary manner in these troubling times. Um, they wouldn't spend so much if, if they didn't think that one, we had the potential to do it and two, that what they're doing is uh, efficient in preventing us from attaining the ideological clarity that's uh, fundamental in, in at a time when I think at least in the U.S. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure it's a similar situation in Europe, but uh, something approaching objective revolutionary conditions uh, seems to be on the horizon at least. Um, so uh, thank you both for, both very much uh, for being here. Is there anything uh, either of you would like to plug before we go? Uh, well, thank, thank, thank you both for a wonderful conversation. I think it's been very rich, and I think it's important the uh, extent to which the struggle that we're involved in is very different than the struggle on the part of the bourgeois cultural apparatus, because what the bourgeois cultural apparatus is trying to do is hide the very nature of reality. And what we have on our side is reality. And as Michael Parenti often said, reality is radical. 
meaning that people are being exploited, oppressed, killed in wars, killed due to environmental degradation. And so we have a reality on our side, which is a great struggle to be involved in, even if our resources are much more limited, our platforms are much less visible. We are fighting on the side of reality and we're fighting on the side of people for their liberation. And so in that regard, I think that um, it's, it's obviously a struggle worth, uh, worth being involved in and something that is, uh, you know, echoing back to our conversation around dialectic, something that is uh, objectively of value, not just subjectively. Uh, so those are my final comments, but I would say that uh, I did want to make sure everyone heard me earlier that uh, Emric has written a very important book on Michel Cusca, who's the figure we were talking about earlier that's coming out with Iskra Books. I had the privilege of writing the foreword to that. We're going to do a book launch in the Critical Theory Workshop Summer School, which is going to pay, take place in July. Um, and so I at least wanted to plug that and highlight that. Uh, but otherwise, that's it from my end, other than thanking Carlos and Midwestern Marks for hosting this and for collaborating once again on uh, an important conversation. America, is, is there anything uh, you'd like to, by the way, um, if you ever want to plug the book, we'd be happy to, to help uh, offer our, our, our space to plug the book as well. So, uh, but anything you'd like to plug before we go? Oh, no, no, just to, 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 to renew my, my, um, all my thanks, uh, because, uh, it, it was very, it was great to, to have this uh, discussion, uh, with, I hope to, 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 to pursue it in, uh, to follow it in, uh, in Paris and, uh, I hope that um, I, I, it was very difficult for, to, for me to 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 hear all all the things. I I hope we we can uh, find some some better ways to 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 hear each other. But of course, we we understand each, uh, us uh, very very well. That's uh, that's a major point. And thank you very much, comrades. Absolutely. So we'll sign out to the international the same way we came in. Thank you both for coming on again, and thanks to everyone who watched. Uh -huh.